Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah Waliya salihin Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Khatam al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen Allahumma salli wa sallam Ala abdika wa rasulika muhammad Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa barak wa sallam All praise are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds And surely Allah is the friend and protector of the righteous And I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad, to his family, to his companions, to all those who call to his way forever. My, be my beloved brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, it is again a great privilege uh, to be with you here tonight. And uh, as we have been reflecting in the last past two weekends about what is happening around us uh, in this winter season and the change that the people are going through uh, with the weather and also with the, the new culture which is being reinvented and which is being brought back. And we saw a number of issues that came out. There were two key points that I began with two weeks ago and I wanted to just emphasize these two points, and that is these are forms of shirk. Now we know uh, shirk as being shirk al-Akbar, shirk al asra There are major forms of shirk and there are minor forms of shirk. And the minor form, of course, is a riya, that is doing acts of uh, religious acts to be seen by people. It's like doing your deen, you're showing off. Not just for Allah, you're also doing it for people. So that is a form of shirk. And shirk is when you don't do your action just for Allah, but there's something else. So it, it's sharing now, like sharika, which is a business. And the sharika is a partnership. There's a president, there's a vice president, secretary, treasurer. It's all part of one uh, company. This is the sharika in Arabic. So the shirk is also when people uh, assign the powers of God, the powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to human beings or to creatures, parts of the universe, or to themselves. And there are two forms of shirk that the ulama have uh, designated for us. Uh, one is um, shirk ad-du'a, and, and that is a, a type of poly polytheism that actually comes through your prayers uh, and also when you invoke uh, other than Allah, when you are sacrificing to other than Allah, so when the person is now reaching out uh, to a force other than Allah and it starts to take the place of the Creator or share, then this is actually a dangerous form of shirk. And this is something which is coming about through the, the, the concepts that many young people are being fed uh, with the uh, general culture within the society. We, remem we remember even with the, 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 the Christmas thing, that Santa Claus, right, this individual who has nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with Isa alayhi salam, and the, the, the ceremonies that we see, the opposite of what you'd expect from Isa alayhi salam, but yet this is the most powerful individual. And we even learn descriptions which are innocently being given to children. And as I was riding down the 401, coming here uh, sometime, uh, 10 days ago or so was right around the time of Christmas. And they said on the radio, uh, a type of jingle they call it, right? A type of song, but it stays in the mind of the child. And the song went, he knows when you are sleeping, he knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been good or bad, so be good for goodness sake. You ever heard that before? He's smiling, man, he knows it, right? Right, you know that one, right? That's being pounded into the minds of children in an innocent way. But break it down. If this individual knows when everybody is sleep sleeping and when everybody is awake, who can know that? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who can know if we are all good or bad? Only Allah azza wa jal who knows our hearts because you can put out an image of being uh, a good person but really be bad. And, and we have heard descriptions of the hypocrites, right? That the hypocrite shows you one face, but inside there's something completely different. 
So this image now being uh, projected to the youth and bringing them something, bringing them gifts, this concept, and then this becoming a beloved individual. And for when the child is very young, you love this individual. Okay, which takes us to another form, shirk al-mahabba. And there is a form of polytheism for your love. Who do you ultimately love? And our love should be primarily for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in human form, um, it comes to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu But even in the form of the love to the Prophet, peace be upon him, there's conditions. And we are so fortunate to have the sunnah where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was, was very clear in how he dealt with people. And when they would come to him and say, uh, a Bedouin would come and say, who are you? And he would tell him, I am the son of one of your women. That's all. Not Fulan, Fulan with this title and all these other things. He said, I'm the son of one of your women. When they would come into Medina sometime and see the halaqa, and they would look at the believers, they would not know which one is the Prophet ﷺ until he began to speak. When he began to speak, then it was clear. But in terms of what he looked like, how he carried himself, right, carried himself as a human being. And, and, and this is very important, um, that again, the love as an individual, right, that we have the love of the Prophet ﷺ, but still we reserve a special uh, love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the creator of all of us. And so these are concepts which um, are creeping back into society in many different ways. And we should be aware of this as we go through um, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to try to be very practical in this. And I want to take an approach which is slightly different to try to look at how Islam is inclusion. And the Prophet Sallallahu in his form of Islam actually saw human beings as part of one family and he also saw the Prophets as one brotherhood. And so he related to the Prophets and Messengers who came, who were clearly mentioned to him in the Qur'an, there are 25. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala told us in Surah An-Nahl verse 36, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ التَّعْبُدُ And verily we have sent to every nation a messenger that they worship uh, the Creator, worship Allah, and stay away from Taghut. And the Taghut is the one who wants to be worshipped in the place of Allah. So it was very clear, and we saw it, how it is set up. Right? Those who worship the Creator, and those who would worship other beings or other parts of the creation itself. And the Prophet ﷺ on one occasion um, spoke to his companions and he said, the prophets are like a beautiful building. And the people came by and they looked at the building and it was so beautiful, but there was something wrong with the building. And that was that one lebina, one brick was missing. Now imagine now you come and you see this beautiful building or this beautiful wall that's there and then you see there's a missing brick. So you would focus on this brick, something's wrong. And then he said, I am that brick. And with me, the prophethood is sealed. So the beautiful building has been completed. So what he was saying to us is that he is not the whole building itself that we are actually part of a community of people who have worshipped the Creator in all different societies. Recently, uh, the Mi'kmaq people, Mi'kmaq nation, who live, uh, they are First Nations people who live in Newfoundland area. They were the first native people to meet the European uh, explorers, Jacques Cartier and them, when they came in. They were the first ones to make contact. And recently, um, the Grand Council of the Mi'kmaq uh, released information about their beliefs and their teachings. And they showed that their concept of God is niskem. They use the word niskem. And when they describe niskem, it is as though they are saying the beautiful uh, Asma al-Husna, 
the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see the same concepts that are reflected. So somebody at some point came to this nation and taught them the belief in one God. And that is in line with the text in Surah An Nahal that is saying, Kulli Ummah, every nation has got a, a messenger at some point in time, there is monotheism. So we are part of this uh, manifestation, this nation of oneness, oneness of the Creator. We see humanity as one. So we're not different uh, beings. We're all human beings, brothers and sisters. Different nations, different colors, different languages, to know one another. But we're all part of the same family. You see, so oneness, right? So Islam is supposed to bring oneness. It's not supposed to be separating us from people, but it should be bringing us together with people. And if there are differences in the people, then the difference is in their beliefs. But it's not the person themselves. You see, some people even start to look at races of people and think that uh, this is a Christian race, this is a Muslim race, this is a Hindu race. It's the human race. It is Banu Adam. And anybody can enter into Islam. And so that is the concept that he brought. And the people of the book Ahlul Kitab, the ones who received the message uh, before, who had a specific message, had a, was another relationship. So that's a closer relationship now. Even though there may be forms of uh, uh, disbelief that, that it crept into their, their understanding, but because the foundation is there, the foundation is there, then uh, this concept of Ahlul Kitab uh, was expressed. And the Quran itself mentions Isa alayhi salam, for instance, 25 times. It mentions Al Masih 11 times. It mentions Ibn Maryam 23 times. And in Surah Ali Imran, for instance, there are 83 verses which are, which are focusing on straightening out the differences between um, the, the, the people of the book. Okay, so this is how we have to look at ourselves as the people of the book. Recently, in the recent propaganda that is used against Muslims to pump up the Islamophobia, they try to project Muslims against Christians. Like a Muslim is a natural enemy of a Christian or a natural enemy of a Jew, right? But this is the opposite of what it originally was. We are natural allies. Right? We look upon ourselves as allies. If the individual now does something to break the alliance, then we deal with it. But in the beginning, the person is innocent until proven guilty. That is our understanding. And it's a very important one to have when you're dealing with people of the book. Especially we want sunnah now. We want just not sunnah in our uh, address, Right? or sunnah just in how we uh, act in the masjid. We want sunnah in the way we think, right? the way we look at the world, our world view, the way we interact with people, the way we do our business, the way we set up our families. The sunnah affects all of these areas. And so this concept of inclusion, it's a very important concept. It's a very strategic concept. And we need to have strategies like this today, especially when we find ourselves under the gun. We find ourselves being pressurized and attacked in many places in the world. There are many people who are actually our allies. And they are prepared to be our allies. But if we don't respond, or if we don't act in a way you know, that would um, uh, perpetuate this alliance, or would nurture this alliance, then it would never come about. I mentioned the other day that in December, around December 15th, when that individual uh, in uh, Sydney, Australia, he sees the coffee shop in the morning. The whole world now focused on breaking news. And we all woke up and said, oh Allah, please, don't be a Muslim. Don't be a Muslim. 
right? Breaking news. And there it was again, right? In the, in the window was the flag. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah something. And they projected it like that, that this is what he was. But what came out later on is that this individual was a sick man who was known by the Iranian authorities. He was a fraudster. And he ran out of Iran. He went to Australia claiming that he was oppressed by the Iranians. Came into Australia. And he was uh, be accused, he was you know, an accused person for the murder of his ex-wife. Also over 40 cases of sexual impropriety. He was a pervert. He was sick, crazy, majnoon, however you want to say it. And he lost control of himself, right? Did something crazy, right? But because he did that, because he identifies somehow with Islam, all of us are guilty until proven innocent. So now you're supposed to say to people, well, I'm not, I'm not part of that, right? Instead of just walking down the street like normally. If somebody who is insane, a Christian person, who is insane, who does something, who captures a building and, and kills people and whatever, and he's, he's part of a Christian church. There have been many of them. This Andre Brevik, you know, that was in, uh, uh, in Norway, right, who killed so many people. He gunned down like over 100 people. They, they don't show you pictures of what he did, right? This man was receiving information from right-wing extremists, right? He was a Christian nationalist, right-winger, Right? and did not back up on his beliefs. He was open with it. But other Christians walk down the street like normal. They look like him, maybe even go to the same church, but they were not guilty. Okay, So this was a very pressurized situation for us. And in the midst of this, uh, an Australian then made this hash tag and put out on the internet uh, that he said, you know, I'll ride with you. So that if there are any Muslims who feel under pressure, right, because they dress like Muslims, usually a sister, because a brother can hide, like we say, he can be Al, Ali in the masjid and Al, right, when he gets on the bus, right. But, you know, if he looks like a Muslim, he said, I'll ride with you. This is a, this is a Christian now, right. And 250,000 people, 250,000 people also responded. And they said, I'll ride with you. So these were now not Muslims, different religions. They are common people who are allies. This is an alliance. This is an alliance, strategic alliance. And we have to be intelligent now. We have to have you know, the, the type of mind of the Sunnah. The thinking of the Prophet ﷺ is very important thinking. And I want to give you uh, some examples of this. In the fifth year after the prophethood began, the Muslims were being persecuted terribly in Mecca, driven out of their homes, uh, tortured, killed, all insulted, all kinds of things were happening. And the Prophet ﷺ knew that there were many people who had no support. And they, they, you know, they, they really, they, they didn't have any tribe, they didn't have direct support of Angel Jibreel who's helping the Prophet and so he said to them if you go to the country of Al-Habasha there you will find a king who does not oppress anybody nor does he allow anybody to be oppressed it is a land of truth this is what he said it's a land of truth Go there until Allah decides and opens up a way for you. Now look at the thinking now. This is not a Muslim over there. This is a Christian. But he says the man is not an oppressor. So justice, he's establishing justice. He will not oppress you. He will not allow you, you know, allow oppression. That's the way to go. And he said, and again, this is the Prophet ﷺ speaking. He does not speak from himself. He did not speak from himself. He's a form of revelation. When he spoke about Al-Habasha, he said, 
It is a land of truth. There is truth in this land. So he sent the believers across, not necessarily to another Muslim group, but he sent them to the brotherhood of Tawheed, where there is justice and truth. You see this thinking now. So when you think like this, you have allies. You have strategic alliances that you can make with your neighbors, with authorities, with people in other lands. Your society broadens when you have this type of thinking. And so they went across on the first Hijrah into Al Habasha, Abyssinia, Ethiopia, Eritrea. They went into this area and they found Ashama an Najashi. And Ashama was his name, and Najashi was the title. Like you have Caesar or Prime Minister. In English, you say the Negus. Right? I found when I went to Ethiopia and Tigray, they say Nagash. Right? That's the real language he was speaking. And so, but his name was Ashama. And Ashama had uh, a, a, a piercing uh, uh, mind. He was, he was on the fitra. And when the Muslims came, he gave them sanctuary. The Quraysh sent uh, people afterwards to bring them back. But yet Ashama listened. And when, as you know, uh, Jaffa, uh, Ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anh, was brought out, and he read Surah Maryam. Najashi cried, and all the people in his court, they all shed tears. And he said, there's no difference between you and me. You're safe. So sanctuary was given to them. Strategic alliance. The Prophet ﷺ wrote to him. Allah opened his heart, and he embraced Islam. But as we understand from history, he did not necessarily announce to the people that he was Muslim. The Christians at that time, a battle was going on between the Unitarians and Trinitarians. There were those who were still following the teachings of Jesus, of Isa salam, and there were those who followed the Trinity, set up in 325 AD in the Council of Nicaea by the Emperor Constantine of Rome. That was the battle. Trinity worshippers and those who wanted the original unity. Najashi was of the original uh, Unitarians, those who believe in one God. And he was struggling, he was battling. Even at one point, it was a big revolution going on in this country. And he even told the companions, uh, get in the boats and get ready to go. If I am defeated, then leave, go to the Prophet. If I win, you can stay. And there's a beautiful descriptions of the companions. And Ab Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, is sent over uh, the hill and down to penetrate and look at the battle. And he sees the battle and Ashama radiallahu an, he was victorious. And so the companions stayed. They stayed in these lands until the major call was made for the great hijrah, the great migration to Medina. Okay? And, and some uh, historians say that over 25 of the uh, Ethiopians, uh, uh, Abyssinians, actually were part of the Sahaba uh, who left there and went uh, to Medina. They integrated into the community. Najashi himself passed away. The Prophet ﷺ made uh, Salat al-Janaza lil ghaib. This is janaza prayer for an absent person. The first time it was done which solidifies the fact that he was a Muslim. The point is, this is real interfaith, or what you call intrafaith. It's not just everybody saying, we're all brothers, I believe in God, you believe in God. No, this is real. This is in, in practice, in real life. So we in our relationships, if we find good people, we should make strategic alliances, especially in many cases, we're in a state of weakness. We find ourselves in this position, then we need to know how to make strategic alliances, and we need to know how to uh, uh, see where justice is there, where oppression is being you know, defeated. That is the land that we want to be in. 
The second example is after the Prophet ﷺ reaches Medina now. He reaches Yathrib and it becomes al Madina al Manawara, the lighted city. There were three major activities he was involved in right in the beginning. One, to strengthen the relationship of the believers with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is by building an all-purpose Islamic center, Masjid al-Nabi, uh, he built the masjid. An all-purpose Islamic center. I use this terminology, right? Because sometimes people think of a masjid or a mosque as only a place you make salat and you run. But what he set up is an all-purpose Islamic center. Education, social welfare, uh, even political decisions, town hall meetings, counseling, all types of things are going on inside of the building. Right? That's the house of Allah. It's the, it becomes the heart of the community where people go in for, you know, for so many different things uh, that they are, they are in need of. And so that was the first point. Two, to strengthen the relationship of believers one to another. al muakhat And in this he paired the Muslims up. He paired people up. So that you know more about your brother or your sister than just seeing him in the masjid. Right? You'll see another Muslim not feeling well or not doing economically well. Pull him aside. How are you feeling? You know, you feel sick? Let's go to the, the, the pharmacy together. I'll buy you what you need. Right? Think about other Muslims on a different level, right? That's the next stage of a development of a community where we go from the superficial and we start to really become a family with each other, starting to know each other, right? That's the next stage. And the third stage was to strengthen the relationship of the believers to those of other faiths. How did he do this? By a, he did it by a series of proclamations. Some call it a constitution. It may not be a constitution as you know it, one document, but it was a set of proclamations, a type of constitution, where he recognized non-Muslims in the Islamic State. He recognized them. This is a really important move. And he specified the, the Yahud, the Jews of Medina. He specified Benu Qureda, Benu Nadir, Benu Qaynaqa. He specified them and showed they are a nation unto themselves. They have their own beliefs, right? And they'll be dealt with injustice in the society. They're part of our society. And you really can't find documents like this in the world at that time of anybody giving rights like that to, to a non-citizen, you know, citizen, whether it's Rome, China, Africa, wherever it is. You can't find anything like this, right? But he looked at, at, at the other people is inclusion, right? It's strategic alliance, right? So he saw them as part of the brotherhood of Medina. And this is very important in our thinking. As the Medina period then goes on, we find um, another very important uh, relationship starts to come out. And that is with the Christians of the South. This takes us down to the ninth year after the Hijrah. And this is called Am al Wufud. This is the year when the different delegations came to Medina. The Prophet, ﷺ, they had consolidated, Mecca was open. He was like looking to the world now. They were sending out letters to the kings. And so now people were coming to Medina. And one group came from Najran. And this city was, had such a powerful Christian background. Remember now, Najran is toward the south, toward Yemen, right? Remember across where Ethiopia is and Yemen and go back in the, the history, right? You'll see it in Surat al-Buruj and you'll see it in many places. It's a powerful uh, history that goes on there. Najran was like the Kaaba of the Christians of the South. This was like their holy city in a sense. Right? Some of their top scholars were coming from Najran. So it is reported that they came to Medina dressed up in beautiful clothes. And they had gold jewelry on and they came into the masjid in all their fanciness and everything. Uh, and when they came in, um, one of the first things the Prophet did, he looked at them and he said, we are simple people. This is not our dress. Right? So go change. So you made them take off all these fancy clothes uh, that they had. But they were still arrogant. 
And you know what they said? They said, we were Muslims before you. Look how arrogant they are, right? They said, we were Muslims before you, right? right? We had the book, right? We're before you. And he said, you lie. And he, he, he dialogued with them. He allowed a debate. So it was going back and forth. And the Prophet ﷺ finally said to them in the first phase of their debate, and remember these three things, we're going to go back to them. He said, the issues that, there's three issues that block you from Islam. Three things. One, you claim that Allah has a son. Right? You're saying Allah has a son. This is blocking you from Islam. Number two, you worship or deify, venerate the cross. You worship the cross. You venerate it. Okay, and three, you eat pork. You eat lahm al khinzir. So these three things is your problem. He's debating them now, right? But, but he's, 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 he's recognizing they have the potential and pointing out uh, the things that are wrong. They came back after this and they continued to argue. And then they said to him, don't you say about Jesus that he is the word of God, which God gave to Mary and the spirit from him? Don't you say that about Jesus? Right? He's this kalima, right? He's the spirit, the ruh. And the Prophet ﷺ then said, yes, we do say that. Okay, and the debate now slows down. And in the evening, the Prophet ﷺ was co contemplating this. And uh, a verse from, uh, uh, two verses from Ali Imran were revealed, uh, 59 you know, to 61. And in this, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him uh, you know, a, a way of approaching them and solving the problem. And the Quran then said, In the Mathala Isa and the Lahi Kamathali Adam. Khalakahu min Torabin Thumma Kala Lahu Kun Fayakun. Al Haku min Rabbika Fala Takum min al Mumtarin. It said, Verily the example of Jesus to Allah in the eyes of Allah is like the example of Adam. He created him from dust, from clay. And then he said, be, and it is. This is the truth from your Lord. So do not be of the disputers. And the prophet read this to them now. It's Allah talking to them. La takum min al mumtarin. Do not keep arguing and disputing this. But look at the argument. Because the Christian will come to you and say, um, well, Jesus was born without a father. Do you believe that? And the Muslim will say, yes, I believe that. He's okay, if, if he had no father, then God is his father. See the argument? Somebody's got to be his father. She married somebody. But the, but the Quran then says, but what, okay, if you say that about Jesus, he has a, a mother and no father. What about Adam? Adam has no father and no mother. So what is he? See the argument? If you're going to worship Jesus because of that, then Adam is even more because he has no father and no mother. We could even add another thing, Mary. Uh, we could say also that Eve, Hawa, has got a father in a sense and no mother. You see? So the argument, the Quran then gives this type of challenge, right? And it, it's a way of approaching them, right? Keeping them inside, but trying to straighten out this problem in their mind. Straighten out this problem in their mind. And so, um, they continued again. They continued. And so the Quran continued in Ali Imran. It was revealed and said, if they say that, then, then you gather you know, your children and their children, your wives and their wives, gather everyone together, and then call the curse of Allah upon yourself. Whoever is wrong, be cursed by God. That's, that's mubahila. That's serious, right? So that's the level that the challenge reached. Right? Let's call the curse of Allah. When the Najranis heard this, they say, that's too much. They were afraid of him, right? They could sense the creator in him. And they said, we're not going to go that far. Because they knew, they were shaky inside. 
but they were too arrogant to admit it. And so they said, we, we're not going to accept Islam. But we will live under your rule and we will pay jizya. And the jizya is a tax that is allowed to the people of the book. Remember this term, you're going to hear it on CBC. Right? Jizya is, is, is a tax. In, in an Islamic state, Muslims pay zakat. Right? We naturally pay and we give it to a, na a national treasury house. And the rulers, that you know, the, the, the society takes care of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the welfare of the society. Just like we pay income tax, we have taxes in Canada. So when the snow comes down on the road, and you wake up tomorrow morning and there's all this snow, right? All night there's people clearing the road, putting down salt. Who's paying them? They're not doing it because of the goodness of their heart. No, they're getting paid. Good pay too, by the way. Who does, where does it come from? Our taxes. You see? So with an Islamic state, if there's people who are not paying zakat, but they're accepted in society, they should pay a tax as well. That's the jizya tax. And the jizya, in most cases, is less than zakat. Less. So this argument now about this being imposed upon people, unjustly imposed upon people, this is how you defeat that argument. You show them everybody pays taxes here, and this is a, a, a poll tax, you know, which uh, people of the book and other people will pay in a Muslim society because they're not paying zakat, uh, you know, within our society. Eventually, the Najranis accepted Islam. They went back to, to Najran. Interesting, though, they said to the Prophet, Sallam, Can you send somebody back to us? who you love. Allah loves him and you love him. And this person can solve our problems because we have some financial problems. And we've got to pay uh, jizya now. So we need somebody with a clean mind who can help us straighten this out. A really trustworthy person. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, he stood by the Prophet says, I'm hoping to be the one. Right, but the Prophet looked away and he said, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, radiallahu anh. So he sent Abu Ubaidah. And this is another interesting point, because Abu Ubaidah was probably one of the most committed Muslims in the ranks of the believers. Frontline person, totally committed, but yet he is going to go amongst Christians who did not accept Islam. Think about this. They did not accept Islam, and then he will help them sort out their financial affairs using an Islamic mind, right? That's a form of da'wah too. Because with Abu Ubaidah's presence amongst them, right? Then eventually they all said, this, we love this religion. Look how we were treated. We were not forced to be Muslim, right? We were given respect, right? They start thinking about these three issues. These three issues. And remember these issues. How he told them. Your problem is you say that God has a son. Think about this Christmas uh, season now, what's going on now, right? Also, you worship the cross. And we see the crosses all around the places. The cross, in a sense, uh, you know, the, 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 the putting Jesus, right, as the son, this is like shirk, right? It's a general category of shirk and kufa. The cross is like a symbol. So these symbols also you have to watch out for. And that's the way they get us with the Christmas trees and mistletoes and this and that. All these symbolisms come in. And we'll go into Easter season as well. Right? We got Valentine's Day coming, Easter, right? which inshallah we'll discuss later on. Right? But symbolism, that's your second area to be aware of. Third, eating pork. And look at it now. Many of the Christmas tables, when you eat, you've got to have ham on the table. I studied and lived with the Muslims in Spain. And when, after, after almost 500 years, Muslims were driven out of Spain and tortured and killed, and, and the Catholics took over, one of the ways that they would you know, test a person, every single meal that the Spanish would eat has wine and pork. It's on the table all the time. 
Even in some shops, if you go to Granada right now, and they still, they have to hang a piece of pork. Uh, they have symbolic pieces too. You have to hang pork in front of your shop. So by the pork, they know that's a Christian there. And they will test the Muslim. They invite you over to eat. They look at your meal, every meal that they're eating. Right, so they're testing. Look what the Prophet is saying. But the deep part about this that came out, you know, in listening to some, um, you know, very, you know, solid scholars in Islam, very interesting point I want to share with you tonight. And that is, remember these three points, right? One is about, they say that Jesus, uh, you know, the shirk with Jesus being the Son of God. The two is the cross, right? And the three is the pork. In the signs of the last days, in the books of Alamat al you will see in the discussion of Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam. Abu Huraira reports that the Prophet sallam said, Wallahi layanza anna ibn Maryam hakaman adalan fal yukassadanna salib wal yaktulanna al khinziya wal yadanna al jizya ila akhir al hadith. This is in Sahih Muslim. So in this section of the hadith, the Prophet said, By Allah, wallahi. He said, By Allah, the son of Maryam will descend as a just ruler. Hakaman Adalan. Okay, that's the first thing. He's not God, right? Remember the three things. He's not the son of God. How is he coming? Hakaman Adalan. Secondly, he will break the crosses. He will break the crosses. Remember the second issue that the Prophet ﷺ said to them. Your problem is you worship the cross. What is Jesus going to do? He's going to break the cross. And three, he will kill the swine. He will kill the swine. He's going to finish with, with pork. That's the third point. And these are the three issues that came up in the uh, debate that went on with the people of Najran. It's a very interesting connection. And it's something we need to consider when we are talking to people of the book, when we are interacting with people of the book. We need to consider this in our relationship, that we are all part of one family, but there are some that have problems. And we need to be very clear uh, and very open with the problems. And so this is the real relationship. It's not an artificial one. It's a working relationship, a relationship of alliances, but also clear differences. If they do not, if they do not come forward, then we say we are the Muslims. We are very clearly of the believers. So I want to leave you with these thoughts. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to open up the floor. I think we have about four minutes left. For any immediate questions that anybody has uh, concerning this subject. Yes, brother. 